हेलो एवरीवन एंड वेलकम टू अवंतिका डिजाइनरिंग सीरीज और ए डी एस एस वी लाइक टू कॉल इट एवरी वीक ऑन वेडनेसडे वी फीचर डिजाइन एंड टेक्नोलॉजी लीडर्स हु शेयर दर प्रोफेशनल जर्नी दर थॉट्स ऑन दर डोमेन ऑफ वर्क एंड डिजाइनरिंग वेर द वर्ल्ड ऑफ डिजाइन एंड इंजीनियरिंग मीट मेक श्योर यू फॉलो अस ऑन सोशल मीडिया इंस्टाग्राम लिंकड इन फेसबुक एंड ट्विटर एंड विद दैट लेट्स कंटिन्यू विद योर शो A designer's design has a radical impact on the users which has the power to transform the society. The shift in behavior that connects people to the environment and empathize in fact and live sustainably are one of the core areas of designing for social impact. Taking a step back from the world and observing its movement with a pace is the resilience we are looking for as future designers creating an impact. Here in the second part of our special episode with David Kusuma we get into conversation to discover the realm of design with dynamics which creates a psychological impression on us and our DNA as designers having power of such kind to induce positive change among people is the responsibility to look forward to we also move to getting interesting insights into the questions raised by our listeners let's move to the second part of our special episode with david kusuma so david as a follow up to the last question how do you suggest mass companies and brands uh, should change their activities and make a responsible production at the core of their business Yes, uh, Rohit. By mass companies, I'm assuming you mean large companies. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say that just about every company has a sustainable initiative sewn into their corporate strategic plan. You know, wherever they are and uh, whatever they end up making. Uh, some have been doing a great job, while others have been criticized at talking a lot. but not really walking the talk you know not really taking the actions required at uh, tupperware we employ lca models you know these are life cycle assessment models uh, to determine the environmental impact of any new product that we develop and that we launch into the market a lot of people don't know this but we actually develop a lot of products um every year we launch between 150 to 200 new products so it's a lot and it's important that we understand our impact um for those unfamiliar with life cycle assessment uh you know it's a very detailed process of calculating what's known as cradle to grave analysis and of course the objective is to get to cradle to cradle where you reuse the materials in the product for you know additional cycles um a second or third life or more uh but environmental impact you know is really a complex topic and education is a large part of that effort you know so that we can make a difference uh we need to change behaviors um both internally within the company and externally meaning what people actually do with our product and what the LCA has taught us is that we can achieve some improvement you know at the design and the manufacturing level you know in terms of the materials that we pick in terms of how we actually manufacture our product uh, so that we can reduce the environmental impact but really the largest impact and most people don't know this actually comes during the consumer phase you know the consumer use phase basically when the customer has taken ownership of the product And here we found that if we can educate our customer to wash their Tupperware in cold water instead of hot water, they immediately can cut their carbon footprint in half just through energy savings. You know, and there have also been a lot of talk about using renewable materials such as biopolymers. And here I would say that we also need to be very careful because not all biomaterials are equivalent. while some can be applied and incorporated properly most biomaterials are unsuitable because their functionality is either not up to spec you know i had mentioned before that for tupperware we offer a lifetime guarantee 
Um, or the biomass requires more energy to convert, you know, from from raw materials into moldable feed uh, feedstock. So it makes them less environmentally friendly than people expect. Uh, so at the end, both companies and consumers, they need to find a way to resolve this issue really together. Uh, if you look at the statistics, only between 9 and 11 percent of plastics that are in the world, which can be recycled, actually get recycled. Because in a lot of places around the world, we just don't have the system mechanics, the, 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 the mechanism to take back the products. You know, so behavioral change is really key. And this is, again, both from an industrial as well as a consumer standpoint. Uh, if we take into consideration the global footprint network, you know, this is a network that at Tupperware we're observing. Uh, it's an organization which measures the environmental footprint and the health of the world and, and the health based on its ability to regenerate due to overproduction and overconsumption. And this network basically has indicated that we are already losing the fight. If we don't make significant changes by the year 2050, we will need 2.3 Earths to provide all of the materials and all of the resources to continue maintaining what we're producing today and what we're consuming. So this means that if we don't change the way we do things and we don't change the way we treat this earth, it means that significant scarcity uh, will probably come. So again, there is no time to waste. That's interesting. So while you mentioned Tupperware, uh, Tupperware has sent their third launch of research with NASA and TechShot to International Space Station a few months ago. Do you think this is opening up a new era for industrial design altogether? Yes. First, it has been a real privilege uh, for me to be involved in designing for space. Um, when we engaged in this project, we had a lot to relearn because, you know, the physics of how things work on Earth don't work in the same way in space. Our project was designed to grow plants in deep space. Um, astronauts, they are living longer and longer in orbit. And their access to fresh food, you know, when we talk about uh, fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, it's becoming more and more important. Uh, in the development of this project, we had the opportunity to work closely with the, the Life Sciences Laboratory uh, of NASA's uh, that is at uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it's actually just a short distance from where we are here, so it was actually very convenient. Uh, but we were also invited to Houston to visit the space kitchen at Johnson Space Center. And this is where they cook, they package, and they freeze dry food for flight to the International Space Station. So the big design challenge right from the beginning was how to control the water in absence of gravity. On Earth, you know, there's of course a gravity effect. When you pour water into a potted plant, for example, water goes down, um, to the bottom, and then the roots know uh, to extend downward, and the plant knows to grow upwards. But in space, the water wants to go everywhere. So we were working also with NASA's Glenn Research Center. Uh, the Glenn Research Center actually has NASA's um, primary expertise on fluid dynamics in microgravity. Uh, and we solved this issue by applying three fundamental principles. They were using specialized geometry to channel the water, um, manipulation of surface energy. You know, so if you have higher energy, uh, the water would want to bind a lot tighter. If you had low energy, then it would want to uh, repel. Uh, and then using capillary action, you know, capillary forces, uh, using special materials uh, to channel the water as well. Um, in the scope of so many research projects being done on the space station, uh, Tupperware is such a small player. Uh, but, you know, in direct answer to your question, I would say the answer is yes. Um, you know, designers do have an opportunity. Uh, in fact, the WDO is currently working with the International Space Station. Uh, I had um, uh, alluded a little bit to that previously. Um, but looking to develop the capability to improve mental 
health and also happiness of people um, who live in space and tying that, you know, into small isolated communities uh, because it doesn't have to just be space. Uh, the benefit is that whatever we learn, uh, we can bring to uh, larger communities and scale it up, right? Um, and so we can also look at, uh, you know, using this as an exercise to benefit larger metropolitan areas as well. Um, I believe as humankind ventures out into deep space, there will be more and more opportunity for design um, uh, for this profession of ours to play a role to develop a higher quality of life for space travelers. Um, some of you may have heard about the Lunar Gateway. Um, so this is the successor to the um, International Space Station. It's currently in development. It's currently um, uh, uh, in process of being designed. Some of the components actually have already been designed, uh, but it's a mini space station that's um, um, planned to be in uh, lunar orbit to allow both uh, a return of man to the lun lunar surface uh, as well as to launch into deep space. So I'm sure design can play a prominent role uh, in developing solutions for human habitation in space, but we will need to learn about the science surrounding space conditions because again, all objects used on Earth for the same function really needs to be totally redesigned for the weightlessness of space. So as a profession, we will need to listen before doing, and that's something that not all designers are good at doing. Wow, I, I, you know, David, uh, the sheer understanding of the kind of project that um, you guys are working on is so exciting. And I'm sure that at the ground level, while you're working on all of these ideas, it would be so interesting. So that takes me to the next question, which is how the world of industrial design and technology work in synergy to propagate a habit of responsible consumption in mass users. I would say that um, I live in a world of design and technology. Uh, it's part of our modern day DNA at Tupperware. You know, uh, it's more than just food storage containers that people uh, think about when they think of Tupperware. Both design and technology can work in harmony, but if the objectives and intent are not aligned, you know, it can also be destructive. So we have to be careful. Uh, for responsible consumption, uh, I believe we really need to look at the objects we design and also our environmental impact, not only today, but especially in the future. You know, we don't think enough about what will be the environmental impact of our products in 10, maybe 20, or even 50 years from now. You know, currently when people talk about pollution and also about environmental contamination, they focus primarily on the sins of plastics materials used bad ways in a poor way. You know, for example, single use plastics, uh, which has led to poor behaviors and contributed to the uh, global problem of pollution and contamination. You know, and this uh, problem is definitely significant. Um, but as designer product developers, we need to shift consumer preferences from single use into hard, durable, multi-use packaging. Um, if, I, if I think about what is going on today in the market of products that we all work on, there is another pollution problem of tomorrow that's already growing uncontested today. You know, the world is afloat in smart products, for example where 1.5 billion smartphones were sold last year, and, and that was only in 2019. Uh, if we add to these our personal computers, our smart home appliances, really anything related to the Internet of Things, you'll suddenly notice a growing problem that will raise its head in the not too distant future. Um, most people change their smartphone every one, two or three years. And most of them end up in the garbage, unfortunately, because they're designed with so-called no user serviceable parts. And the PC boards that are in them are rarely recycled because they have toxic elements. You know, and if we don't work quickly to resolve this issue, electronics will soon be known um, the same way as plastics is today uh, for pollution of tomorrow. You know, so 
uh, we, we really have to keep this top and center as we are developing new products. I would say even for the pandemic, for example, of COVID-19, in our rush to solve uh, PPE, you know, personal protective equipment, we forgot to consider what to do with them after they're used. Unfortunately, you know, it has become more and more common to see things like gloves and masks and other PPE on the roadside, you know, outside of our stores and our, our, our supermarkets, our grocery stores, just littering the landscape. You know, and these items are potentially con contaminated, uh, so nobody wants to clean them up. Um, you know, so in resolving one problem or in working on trying to find solutions to one, we've created another huge problem. So design and technology together need to look to the future. How can we design and what technologies can we incorporate, uh, you know, and what effects our, our objects that we develop will have on the future health of our planet? You know, I want to urge us all to remember that we only have one planet and one life. And we should take every opportunity to make our time here count. There's, there's so much insightful conversation, and and I think I can go on and on. But uh, somewhere we will need to, uh, you know, move towards wrapping up the session. And I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, apart from my questions, I have some from the audience as well. So before we move into the audience question, if you were to talk to us about one product or project that Tupperware has done and that's closest to the goals of sustainability, what would that be? Yes, I can, of course, talk about many, but I will focus myself on this whole issue of sustainability. Um, I'm actually very proud of some of the products that my team has developed and launched over the many years. Um, and we have not done it by ourselves. We've actually worked with uh, a number of universities and a number of innovative uh, partners, you know, to develop the new technologies, uh, which could bring new consumer benefits. Uh, one of the ones that uh, I want to bring to mind uh, are uh, wood plastics. We actually launched uh, a series of products that use natural wood. Um, but I would want to point out as well that we were not cutting down trees. You know, we were actually taking um, wood shavings, or let's say wood uh, fibers, uh, discarded wood sawdust from a lumber yard. And um, uh, normally these would be thrown away, but we had the opportunity to take them and um, compound them into plastic materials that we could then injection mold into products. And we launched this new, new line called Allegra, which actually was beautiful. But it required a lot of technology. And the reason why I say that is because it is a natural material, wood, you know, even, even wood sawdust. So just like if you were to put a nice wooden chair or a nice wooden table out on your patio um, in the rain and in the sun in a few months, uh, it would weather, you know, um, and that's the same with our product. Some people like it and some people don't, but it's still patinas. Um, but the problem with wood fibers is that as it gets wet and as it gets um, weathered, the wood fiber likes to stick up normal to the surface of the table. So one of the things that we had to do was actually to take the sawdust, we would incorporate it into a special coating, a special food grade coating to protect the fibers before compounding, right? And then we would upcycle it into these beautiful Tupperware bowls. And the, the, the incorporation of the coating actually controlled the fibers. The product still weathered, which means that the color changed, but you didn't see any of these effects of the fibers coming out. You know, it's difficult for us when we are looking at recycled materials because at Tupperware, we cannot take post-consumer materials and just regrind them and remold them into new food storage containers, for example, uh, because we have requirements, uh, requirements related to direct food contact certifications. It has to be safe for using with food. So we've used a um, uh, a recycled material that comes back, a uh, post-consumer material, into a new product line, which we call Recycline. We've made a whole new set of products 
that are not required to be food safe, you know, products that are like uh, holding your paper towels, um, holding your bottles or your soaps, you know, things like that. Uh, but most recently, we've also incorporated circular polymers, which are basically plastics that are recycled through chemical recycling. It uses a special process of pyrolysis, you know, using, uh, let's say, high pressure and temperature uh, in order to break the material back down to its original constituents and then rebuilding the polymer from that. And then those are food safe because you're basically creating a new polymer out of old materials. Um, uh, you know, so, so that's on the material side, but I just want to make one last mention, and that is that we focus extremely hard on food conservation, you know? So uh, we want consumers to know that if they use a certain type of product from Tupperware, that there's a net positive benefit where their food will stay fresher for a longer period of time. You know, and we have uh, a number of products uh, for fruits and vegetables. We've made products for uh, cheese, uh, products for breads, for example. Um, I'm just gonna point to the one for fruits and vegetables. Uh, and we did this with um, studies um, together with some land grant universities here in the US. A land grant university is basically a university where the government has given a lot of um, money and also a land uh, in order for agricultural research. And we worked with um, a number of these universities that are focused on post-harvest uh, food storage um, to um, uh, develop the science that would allow food to last longer. A lot of people, when they buy their fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, from the supermarket, they, they, they store them just like any other food. But what they don't keep in mind or what they don't have in their mind is that these foods are actually still alive, even in their post-harvest stage. They may have been harvested, uh, but they're still alive and they're still uh, um, uh, going through a respiration cycles, you know, they still need oxygen. They still need to exchange with, um, with um, carbon dioxide and ethylene gas that's being um, um, uh, created on the inside of the container. You know, so all of the science boiled down to uh, uh, an opening in the container, which by the way, was a real game changer at Tupperware. You know, for so many years, we'd been telling consumers that the best way to store food is to place them in hermetically sealed containers. Now suddenly we are telling them that certain uh, types of produce needs to go into containers that actually have holes in them. You know, it was something very difficult for our senior management uh, to appreciate, but when they finally uh, understood it, uh, we went forward with the project, you know, and this has now become one of our biggest selling products worldwide. Uh, and it's a product that um, um, allows consumers, depending on what they're putting in, uh, to keep their fruits and vegetables for up to two to four weeks longer than normal. Well, that's really exciting. So moving from there uh, to some of the questions from our audience. So David, for this show, we launched a campaign where we requested industrial designers, students uh, who are studying designing to share questions that they wish to ask you. And here are a few questions from our audience uh, that I'm going to put up next to you. So the first one is from a student called as Manasi Parulekar. And she wants to know that according to you, which is the one important step in the process of developing a product that optimizes the quality of a product? Sure. Um, so it's really important that we are process driven. Uh, you know, and it's um, it's it's one of the things that I had mentioned a little bit earlier in the show in which designers have had uh, the tendency to want to start working uh, before they are listening, you know, before they take the time to understand the problem very well. So in my opinion, you know, we do at Tupperware a lot of uh, design research, a lot of ethnographic research before we start a project. Uh, we had started a project a few years ago um, for Latin America, uh, looking at how they um, utilize um, um, uh, kitchen devices in their kitchens. And we, and we performed a lot of home visits 
you know, we always take the opportunity to bring uh, our design team also along with our engineers uh, to do a lot of observation. You know, of course, we don't work by ourselves. Uh, we work with, um, with, with professional ethnographic uh, researchers as well, uh, people who are uh, anthropologists, for example, uh, who really know how to ask the right questions. And also, um, you know, it's, it's important, for example, that um, uh, we are somewhat surprising. You know, we don't want people to clean up their houses just because we're coming. We want to be able to see, uh, you know, the real status of the places that they work, you know, the places that they actually cook their meals and uh, prepare them and serve them and, and, and the places uh, like their refrigerators that, uh, or their freezers where they store their food. You know, all of this gives us a tremendous amount of information. Uh, if I skip forward a few years to today, um, you know, then um, a country like Brazil, for example, is, is, is our number one uh, country in the world. They buy more Tupperware than anywhere else in the world. Uh, a lot of it was um, targeted um, first because we understood uh, exactly what their needs, you know, and what their desires and wants were. Uh, and it's purely through design research. Interesting. And moving on to the next one, Pradyuman Zoshi wants to know your thoughts on what do you think is the future of manufacturing practices with plastic being replaced with sustainable options and 3D printing in the picture? Sure, that's a great question. There are a lot of um, uh, uh, efforts, uh, you know, in terms of making 3D printing into a viable technology for production. And uh, in fact, the whole industry has wanted to shift in that direction. You know, instead of 3D printing just for prototyping, um, the whole industry now calls themselves additive manufacturing, which means that they really want to focus on mass production. Um, but, you know, I think in some industries, definitely in industries that are related to um, medical devices, where perhaps uh, mass production is not really uh, at the same level as consumer oriented products. Um, those, it makes a lot of sense, especially for um, items like prosthesis, where you have to actually fit the size of the person uh, into the component that you will be um, manufacturing and connecting back to them. You know, people have longer arms, um, uh, um, uh, they have, uh, you know, different um, uh, biometrics that conform to uh, their needs. Uh, but in mass production, you know, let's say a Tupperware product uh, where we don't actually even get started unless we can provide a business plan that shows that even at the launch, we have a few million units uh, in the forecast. Uh, 3D printing is still too slow. Uh, I'm not sure uh, it'll ever catch up to the point of injection molding because injection molding, as you know, uh, can have multiple cavities. You know, in fact, uh, if you're making a, um, uh, a cap or a cover uh, for a bottle, uh, you know, you can have a um, mold that has, gosh, maybe, maybe 40 or 50 cavities. So each time the mold closes and each time it opens, which by the way, could be something like half a minute to a minute, uh, you're making 40 or 50 of these units. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy for 3D printing to catch up. However, you know, I think that uh, 3D printing is definitely a disruptive technology. Uh, and anyone and any company that has any, um, any market focus on plastics needs to have some kind of a strategy for 3D printing. The uh, important thing for us to keep in mind is that, um, you know, there are opportunities that 3D printing can also get into uh, if we look um, at the sustainability side. So, for example, uh, the filament, you know, there are um, so many um, disposed of um, single use containers that come from restaurants. Most of them are made of PLA, which is polylactic acid. Uh, and um, uh, everyone knows about the PET bottles, you know, those single-use 
um, water bottles that everyone buys, you know, at convenience stores, for example, just when you are on the go. And um, most of the materials that are used nowadays for 3D printing incorporate both PET and PLA. Uh, you know, of course, it incorporates more than that. You can also use um, uh, ABS. You can also print in, uh, you know, many other materials. But these two materials that I just mentioned uh, are, are, are used a lot in single-use plastic. So, you know, imagine making filament, uh, you know, recycled eco-filament uh, from reused um, PET bottles, uh, you know, that uh, could end up not only providing, you know, a new benefit uh, for people who are manufacturing their own products, uh, but can also help uh, to make the materials less expensive. You know, there, there, there are lots of uh, potential issues, uh, but I think that is really where we are looking at, you know, in terms of future manufacturing is the balance of uh, mass production uh, versus customized production when we're talking about new technologies like 3D printing. Great. So, David, uh, P. Union Kumar would love to hear from you. What process does Tupperware follow while trying to put up a new product in the market? And how is it different from generic design process? Yes, thank you. Um, so at Tupperware, we do follow uh, the typical process uh, that, that involves design thinking and also human-centered design. But I think what sets us apart are our principles and our focus areas in terms of what's important to the consumer. Uh, I had mentioned in uh, answering the previous question uh, that design research is extremely important because we need to know before we develop a product, um, what are the important values of our consumer and what's, you know, and, and, and how they use things uh, so that um, we can implement the best um, uh, benefit, the best designs into the product. Um, one of the um, key um, statements I want to uh, introduce here is everyday good design. You know, this is important for us when we are developing our product to keep in mind uh, along with the design values. So everyday good design, what that means for Tupperware is that we want our product to be used by as many people um, as possible and as many times per day as possible if, if, uh, if the function requires it or, or provides it. Um, you know, and that is important because the more people use our product, the more value we know we are giving them. You know, we don't develop our products to sit in museums. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, there are a couple design museums around the world that have uh, taken our product and um, uh, incorporated them into their collections uh, because they found the products to be both functional as well as beautiful. But it's not the reason that we do it. We really want to provide as much value as possible. Um, the second thing I want to mention is um, the whole incorporation of soft skills. It's really important that uh, as you're designing uh, products, you know, you really have firsthand knowledge of what you're doing. So we in um, uh, at Tupperware, we, we encourage our designers and our engineers actually uh, to go to cooking school, you know, to understand that if they're developing a product that's going to be used in the environment of a kitchen, they should probably know very well what this product is supposed to do, you know, and with different types of cuisines, different um, uh, cultures around the world, there's many benefits and opportunities to incorporate uh, this type of knowledge into the products directly. Uh, finally, uh, we have a set of um, working principles that were developed from values that are important to our consumers, to our customers, uh, and we've assembled them together. Uh, again, what we keep top of mind when we're developing the product through the process, and there are eight values that are extremely important, um, and I'll share them with you here. The first one is original thinking. The product needs to be fresh. The idea needs to be creative. It needs to not have been done before. Um, the second thing is confidence. You know, this is a trust kind of business. We want to make sure that um, when the consumer purchases our product, um, it does what they expected it to do, you know, and so they can trust our product um, uh, and, and they can use it uh, in the way that was expected. Uh, the third one is desire. We know that our product is not the 
uh, least expensive out there. Uh, in fact, some people say that it's quite expensive, but that's because we tend to use the highest quality materials and we also um, make the product thicker than where you could find in other types of similar products. Uh, and that's because we have a lifetime warranty to honor. So uh, we want our product to be aspirational, that people reach for it, you know, even though it's expensive. Uh, the fourth one is honesty. Uh, and this goes back to functionality. It goes back also to the materials. Um, the product needs to do what it was originally meant to do. People expect it to function and people expect it to work. You know, they don't really care so much about uh, the intricacies of a product. They want it to be intuitive so that it just works uh, and they want it, you know, so that it uh, works every time that they want to use it. Um, the fifth one is hint of surprise. You know, so we try to develop as much functionality into a product as possible uh, so that it does uh, what it's supposed to do extremely well. But guess what? It also does a few more extra things that, uh, uh, you know, the original consumer may not have thought uh, about uh, extending the capabilities that they have. Um, uh, then we have sophisticated simplicity. Uh, sophisticated simplicity means the product can be simple but it can still also be elegant. Uh, number seven, warm, inviting, and friendly. Something that you would love to touch, something that a consumer would love to own. And then finally, quality. A lot of people buy our product uh, because uh, it has uh, um, a reputation of being uh, the highest quality uh, in this market space. Uh, and so we have to make sure that uh, you know, it, it performs to that level and uh, it meets the criteria for um, uh, this quality. Um, I, I also want to mention uh, sustainability because um, you know, I had mentioned that we do uh, life cycle assessments uh, and um, this is important in our process as well because since we develop uh, anywhere between 150 and 200 new products every year, it's really important that we understand uh, the environmental impact of what we put out. So really that is the difference, I think, uh, between our process and what you would call a generic uh, design process. I'm not really sure there is really such a thing as a, gen a generic design process, but I think that's what sets us apart. That's, that's interesting, David. And moving from uh, our audience question to our uh, last question on the episode before we get into something really interesting. So at Avataka University, we coined a term called as designering, which is design plus engineering, which is which is our core philosophy. I wish to understand that how do you think emerging technologies are impacting the field of industrial design? So emerging technologies have been coming out ever since products were being designed. You know, it's not a new phenomenon of today. Um, you just expect that technologies will continue to be developed. Hopefully they continue to improve and hopefully they provide us with the ability to uh, serve humankind uh, better um, than before. You know, um, uh, something that offers something that you haven't had maybe in the past. Um, you know, a designer, normally we talk about ourselves as having a toolbox of um, of, of technologies, a toolbox of resources that allow us to um, uh, do different things and to do things better. Um, at Tupperware, I had mentioned before that we spend a lot of time on food conservation technologies, technologies that allow food uh, to stay fresher longer in storage. But we don't do that by ourselves. You know, we do that with technologists. We do that with universities. Um, uh, it's, it's really important, this whole aspect of what we call open innovation, you know, partnerships. And open innovation is, you know, in my opinion, one of the keys to the future. Um, a lot of people think, for example, that Tupperware is a huge company. I will tell you that we are not. You know, we're really a medium-sized company at best. Um, but we have a huge range of technological interests. You know, and for a company our size, it's not really practical to have all of the technological competencies we want under our roof. 
you know, to hire all these people um, because, you know, our, 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 our product line is so broad. So it's really better and faster to partner with organizations uh, and with technologists who have the expertise uh, and, and, and spend the time to work with them to design new innovative products. You know, from, from my experience, the most innovative products fall within the sweet spot of where you find non-obvious connections, you know, basically creating new products, creating new categories that fall in between, um, you know, let's say a technology company and our company, um, you know, spaces um, or products that neither company could do on their own. So it's really exciting when you can dis um, discover this non-obvious space. You know, so that's what I would uh, suggest uh, in terms of emerging technologies. Uh, look at maximizing the whole process of open innovation. It's uh, really um, the hallmark of the future in terms of incorporating and developing uh, products that utilize uh, uh, new and emerging technologies. So, David, finally, in our last segment, which we call as Gyanvyan, uh, this is essentially a quickie round where we would like you to share your top of the mind responses to our questions. And are you ready for our rapid fire? I will do my best. Great. So my first question to you, David, is what matters to you the most, the effort or the outcome? Oh, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, they're both interlinked um, because without effort, you won't get any outcome. But uh, you can also put in a lot of effort and never reach the outcome. So the outcome is the most important. You want to reach your objectives. Okay. And what is a trend that you would like to see disappear forever and why? Ooh, there, there are several things that I would love to see disappear forever. Not all of them are related to design. Um, so single-use packaging. I would say would be good to get rid of. It's difficult for people because then they would have to prepare um, uh, food in advance instead of buying it along the way. But there are other things that I would love to see disappear. You know, things like bad politics or misinformation. <laughs> or <laughs> okay, that is creative answer. Uh, my third question: What fortune would you want to get from a fortune cookie? Oh. Um, I don't know if I have anything top of mind for that. I've never been to a fortune teller, but I have eaten at Chinese restaurants. So I have, uh, of course, seen uh, uh, fortune cookies. Uh, I guess um, live long and prosper would be okay. Okay, interesting. An advice you would offer young designers breaking into the industry? Sure. So uh, young designers, um, you know, this is really the future of our profession. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of times I see when designers begin their career, uh, they're looking for answers, you know, answers to questions. They're looking for the rules. Um, what they don't know is that they actually have the ability to write the rules, you know, to, to create um, uh, how, how, um, uh, design can offer, you know, a good um, solution uh, for, for, for the benefit of humankind. You know, I think that uh, there's, there's a real uh, interesting uh, phenomenon happening right now, uh, even within the WDO, uh, because we have just uh, started a young designer circle. Uh, in fact, uh, Sahil Jain, the person who invited me to be uh, originally on this uh, program, uh, is a member of that um, group. And uh, they're really charged with three things. Number one, how can we introduce more designers uh, to the WDO so that they can get involved in global projects that are meaningful? You know, and this is uh, really important because, you know, aside from your everyday jobs, you have the opportunity uh, to contribute to social improvement, you know, to society as a whole. Uh, but secondly, as well, you know, how can how can they um, uh, refresh, you know, things that are happening at the global level and introduce them with things that are also important to uh, young designers? You know, how can they build um, um, a, a profession 
that can uh, uh, continue uh, both in terms of uh, stability, uh, but also in terms of growth and, uh, you know, definitely in terms of impact for tomorrow. So, you know, I, I would say let's, you know, please get get involved as, as much as you can. It, you know, there, this is a great uh, a time for design. There's a great opportunity to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to express yourself, you know, again, not only in your daily jobs, uh, but also in, in your contribution to the world. Okay. And what are you super proud of? Um, I'm, I'm proud of many things. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of being associated uh, with uh, the World Organ uh, Design Organization. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to uh, know uh, Avantika and, and, and being connected to you through this program as well. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of some of the work that we've done at Tupperware, uh, you know, because uh, we've also been focused as much uh, on uh, providing um, uh, user benefit as, as, as well as uh, benefits to the environment. Uh, and also, you know, I'm proud of my um, family <laughs> who have kind of uh, stood by me, uh, you know, through, through all of this. I had given a little bit of my background. You know, and definitely going through a lot of schooling as you are also working doesn't give you a lot of time for family. So, you know, it's important to have uh, a lot of support along the way. Excellent. And if you could trade your life with with, with someone for a day, who would it be and why? So I, I have become a real fan of technology, you know, and I love uh, uh, reading about uh uh, things like um, <clears throat> the theory of relativity, uh, you know, so I guess uh, for me, it would be uh, someone like Albert Einstein. Um, you know, I like I like the thought of, um, you know, how do you think about um, time going backwards if you can exceed the speed of light, for example? Uh, someone told me um, once that the best way to imagine it is if you are um, waking up in the morning and you have one of those old digital alarm clocks uh, that showed um, you know the alphanumeric uh, uh, numbers of the time you know so if it's six o'clock uh, you know you, you basically have a beam of light coming from your clock that says six o'clock uh, and if you are able to jump on that beam and travel the speed of light you know, then guess what? It will always be six o'clock. But if you are able to then proceed backwards, which means that you are actually going faster than the speed of light, eventually you will catch up to 559, 558, you know, so that's how time uh, it can be um, uh, proven to go backwards uh, if you can um, uh, travel faster than the speed of light. It's really an interesting uh, concept. So David, my last question, one book that is a must read for everyone, which one do you recommend? Yes. Yeah, so one of the most important books that I've read, um, and it's been around already a few years, uh, is called Blue Ocean Strategy. And this is by um, um, uh, Chan Kim and Renee um, Magorny. And um, it's it, it talks about when you are developing products, you know, you should actually be fishing in blue oceans, blue oceans, meaning um, uh, places and um, uh, uh, technologies that are not really in existence today, you know, where, where, where there are less people uh, in those areas versus red oceans, uh, which are um, highly populated. Uh, everyone happens to be there. It's a very well-known market space. You know, so if you fish in red oceans, you probably will come up with similar solutions. Uh, blue oceans on the other side uh, is, um, you know, uh, blue ocean basically is an analogy to describe, you know, kind of uh, bigger, wider, deeper potential, you know, in an unexplored market space. So, uh, you know, if you're looking for something new, that's where you should be looking. David, I must tell you, this was one of the most insightful podcast recording that I've done till date. Thank you so much for being on our show. It was a pleasure hosting you. Yeah, thank you for um, having me. Uh, I'm very happy to participate, um, Rohit, and especially to be uh, representing the World Design Organization during the World Industrial Design Day on your show. Thank you so much.
Hey there, we hope you enjoyed our show. Do write to us on ads at the rate avantika dot edu dot in. We look forward to your opinions, feedbacks, and suggestions of speakers you would like us to host on this show. Do tune in our channel next week on Wednesday for a new story on Hub Hopper or wherever you get your podcast from. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you.